Welcome to Schweitzer Drive, a podcast where we explore what goes on between the generation of electricity and the light switch. Join Dave Whitehead as he interviews the entrepreneurs, innovators, and experts who are inventing the future of electric power. Hi, I'm Dave Whitehead, CEO at Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories. Welcome to Schweitzer Drive. As communities continue to evolve and grow, power distribution systems are becoming more complex. Utilities are increasingly focused on efficiently managing this complexity and solving new challenges, like the addition of distributed energy sources, microgrids, rooftop solar, and battery storage. Today, I'm talking with distribution system expert John Thorne about some of the advancements he and his team at Alabama Power are developing and deploying to increase reliability and keep the power flowing to its customers. John has worked at Alabama Power Company for more than 20 years, serving in a variety of distribution and engineering roles. He presently holds the position of Power Delivery Test Lab Team Leader, where he supervises mechanical and electrical testing of transmission and distribution hardware, as well as the development of distribution protection and automation systems. He received his BS in electrical engineering from Auburn University in 2004 and holds a professional engineering license in the state of Alabama. Hi, John, and thank you for talking to me today about distribution systems. Yes, sir. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, this is going to be fun. I've been looking forward to this this conversation for quite a while. But before we get into all this stuff, will you provide us a little bit of history regarding Alabama Power and, and who you serve? So, yeah, Alabama Power is one of the three electric utility operating companies within Southern Company. Um, we serve about the bottom two-thirds of the state of Alabama, um, which includes about a million and a half customers with 85,000 miles of line. Um, we're a vertically integrated utility. We have over 11,000 megawatts of generation. Um, I've spent my whole career in distribution, so that's what's kind of close to my heart. And one thing at Alabama that's interesting is we really have a rich history and innovation in our distribution area. Um, we were we joked that we were distribution skater before distribution skater was cool. <laughs> um, so back in the early 90s, we started buying up Spectrum uh, from the FCC, and we started building out a radio infrastructure um, we started with, you know, bolt motors onto motor operated disconnects, um, doing switch cat banks, which, you know, back then nobody was doing switch cat banks on SCADA. Um, and then by the mid nineties, we were implementing some automatic transfer schemes that were RTU logic based and doing great things. We still have a real strong culture of innovation. It's one of our um, real big initiatives that we push for. Um, you know, we're trying to innovate in areas of communication system protection, Um, automation, construction practices, all the areas of our space, we want to be innovative and we want to find better ways to do things. Yeah. And I, I, I just echo, you know, having worked with uh, Alabama power and Southern company for over, over 20 years, I, I I really find you guys to be really progressive and trying new things, coming up with new ideas and, and really innovating certainly on the distribution side, but you know, transmission too, but certainly on the distribution side, new ways to, to keep the lights on to, to more people, even when, uh, you know, things happen on the power system. It's, it's, it, you, you guys are a, a role model for other utilities. Congratulations on all that work. Thank you. I'm very proud to be part of the company well, and the things that we're doing. Yeah. Great, rich tradition, right? Don't, and then yes. what we usually don't, don't mess it up, right? We've got, we got a long legacy. We got to keep, keep going, but, uh, it's keep a lot going. of, that's right. That's right. Specifically, could you tell us what your role at uh, Alabama Power is? Yeah, sure. So during the introduction, you mentioned that, um, you know, I'm, I supervise our test lab where we test um, transmission distribution materials, um, do electrical and mechanical testing of that stuff. And, and I really enjoy that. And that's fun. But really where my heart lies is in the distribution automation and protection. And so we really put a lot of effort into vetting new ideas. Um, you know, we have an innovations group and they come with ideas. We you know, brainstorm with them and come up with ideas. And then, you know, once we want to do something, usually we'll try to kind of do the first basic implementation in a controlled lab environment just to make sure that we're, you know, we're, we're making progress in the right direction before we try a field deployment of it. So that's really the most fun part of being at the lab. It's kind of the mad scientist side of things that I really enjoy. I, I joke that I have the best engineering job at Alabama Power because, you know, I, I get to I get to be a mad scientist and think deep and do great engineering things. I also get to pick up wrenches and screwdrivers. And um, that's, that's, it's a real fun place to be a real fun place to work. 
That, that's a lot of fun. You know, uh, we, we build products that, uh, that go out on power system and, uh, uh, Ed Schweitzer, who founded the company, reminds us all the time that the, the, the power system is not a lab, right? What we do here, we have to make sure we get right. So when it gets deployed on the system, we're, we're, we're not surprised or, or, you know, Alabama is not surprised. So, but I am glad you guys have your own power system to test out new ideas and stuff and, and not use, say, my house or, or somebody in Alabama as your, your, your test facility and let that, that, let them learn alongside with you. That's never fun. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. Today, we're going to be talking about distribution system challenges and engineers. We, we always love a, a good challenge, but some of our listeners may not be familiar with uh, power systems, uh, in particular distribution systems. And, you know, quite frankly, the way that distribution systems are changing these days, certainly when I got into the business and, and where we're at today, are completely, completely different. So maybe you can explain, you know, your thoughts or, or how you would describe a distribution system and, and where it fits in in the electric grid as a whole. Yeah, so the best analogy I know to describe it would be that, you know, the transmission system is kind of like our interstate highway system, right? It's designed to move large volumes of traffic over long distances efficiently. And that's what the transmission system is designed to do, large amounts of power, long distances. But ultimately, when you get to the community where you're going, the interstate's not going to get you to your final destination. So the distribution system is kind of like the surface streets, right? Once you get to that community, you got to get off, you got to get on the surface streets because it's not efficient to route limited access highways through neighborhoods um, all over town. So the distribution system, you know, shorter poles, shorter span lengths, lower voltages, all these things help us be able to get the electricity efficiently around the community. Um, one thing that's also kind of interesting from a, an analogy standpoint is, you know, in your, your small little rural community, the surface streets do really well, right? The little two-lane county roads do really well until the population starts really growing. And when you start to get traffic flowing every which direction, those surface streets start to get congested. And so that's kind of where we're seeing ourselves getting today is load is growing, as load is getting more dense. Also, as we have, you know, distributed generation and other things going on that are causing, I would say, kind of congestion in that system, we're having to be creative and come up with um, special ways to be able to solve that and make sure that we do keep the electricity moving efficiently. I love that analogy. I'm going to use that with my mom. And it, it gets me thinking about the the distribution system and, and, and maybe a neighborhood or, a, a you know, a, a small area where I, I'm seeing, you know, distribution as opposed to like a, a little 13.8 kV line that goes out to, to pick up a, a few houses. Rather, we have communities growing up and what we need is alternate routes you know we're going back to the the streets right alternate routes to get to get to my house because one may be blocked or there's a garbage truck or something so i can get get around to my house i think that's what distribution systems are becoming these these alter you know you have a lot of alternate routes to to get from point a to point b so this is this is going to be fun as communities grow utilities need to serve more customers the distribution systems are becoming more complex and we talked about these alternate routes if we're using the street analogy um so we need more ways to, to, to serve customers, um, neighborhoods, homes, and businesses. Will you take a few minutes and, and talk about what you've been working on to meet these challenges and ensure that no matter where I live, I, I get uh, reliable electricity coming to my house? Yeah, so that's the thing. Back to that road analogy, right? We, we're pretty good at building bigger highways, right? That's what we've been doing forever. You know, the load grows. We need bigger lines. You know, put in bigger wire, bigger substations. We're used to doing that. But what's the challenge that's really coming up is this increased density of load um, combined with the rising expectations for reliability. Um, because what's happening, we get this, this, this pocket of a lot of customers and we have some circuits that might have two or 3,000 customers on a single circuit. And because of this rising expectation, it's unacceptable for one tree falling or one car hitting a pole to take all 3,000 customers service away. So we have to figure out how we're going to manage that. Um, what that's done is it's kind of birthed this automation strategy that we have here at Alabama. So we've been involved in these kind of, you know, distribution automation and doing, you know, protection things for 30 years on our distribution system. But it was always deployed in kind of a hotspot manner, right? We would have a, you know, a critical manufacturing facility over here. So we would deploy some di distribution automation to try to help them or a community that was really suffering with reliability. But what we've tried to do is to really take this blanket approach and look at the company as a whole and figure out how can we deploy automation so that every one of our customers can benefit from this modern technology and not just these specific hotspots where we deploy it. So what we've come up with is a strategy that says 
Well, the first thing we want to do is make sure every circuit has some distribution automation on it, right? And that's what allows every customer to have some benefit. But then the next step is let's take these circuits and let's make sure that we've got blocks of three to 400 customers. And so what that does for us is ultimately what we want to get to a point where any one single fault is not going to affect more than three or 400 customers. Obviously, that's a little bit of an ideal situation, right? Because we all know things happen. But if we can look at our outage summaries over the year and, you know, most of our outages don't affect more than three to 400 customers, that's a huge win, both for us from a statistics standpoint, but more importantly for our customers. Um, The other key to that, though, is alternate feeds also. It's that, you know, it's not just about making this highway wider, right? We also want to make alternate routes there. So we also have to work on these alternate feeds and things like that, because regardless of how small our segments are, everybody downstream of the fault is going to be out unless you have an alternate way to feed them. So these are all the things that we're trying to put together to make sure that we're addressing these issues that are coming up. Um, What's hard about that is that, as we brought up, the more reclosers you put on a line, the harder it gets to make them all work right. So that's the challenge that we're really faced with working through. Let's pull on that thread just a, a, a little bit. I come from protection world and our first job is to detect a fault as quickly as we can and then issue a command to open up a, a recloser or a circuit breaker. And then I usually stop thinking about the problem. You, you talk about automation and to me, you know, in the terms of automation we were talking about is how do I gracefully and quickly put the power system back together to get as many, the lights on to back to as many people as, as, as possible. What, what we're talking about now, there's there's phrases like flizzer. So fault location, isolation, and then system restoration, right? Which is really that that automation piece I think you're, you're, you're talking about is how do we get the lights back on after we've isolated a fault to a particular part of, of, of the power system. You mentioned one of your, the ways that, that Alabama Power is going about it is, hey, let's put in enough reclosers so we can chop up the the distribution line, if you will, so that we can open up a, a part of it and only 300 people will be affected versus the, say the 3,000 people that are are all somehow tied to that that distribution feeder. You refer to it as, uh, I, I believe, high density, high density coordination solutions for for these systems. Maybe you could tell us a little bit, I'm, I'm really intrigued with it, this this technology, what you guys are doing. Maybe you can tell us a little bit of how it works and and, and why you need it. Yeah, so like I said, we'll talk about that 3,000 customer feeder, and we want to break it into 300 customer blocks. That's 10 reclosers, right, that we have to stack. And the the reality is, is the traditional way of coordinating things with just time-based coordination, um, you just don't have enough room. By the time you you take all these devices and make the fur- the furthest one down the line the fastest and each one up the line a little bit slower, by the time you get back to the substation, you're, you're – first recloser is tripping unacceptably slow at that point to where it's it's compromising the integrity of the system, possibly safety and all kinds of things, right? So, so you just can't do that. So we needed a better solution for that. And how do we make all these things work together? And so what we really came up with was there's kind of two different approaches to this. There's a communication-based and a non-communication-based system. So the communication-based system is one that we focused on real hard here at Alabama. And that is where we're going to do communication-based coordination. So the devices are going to talk to each other. And what's what's really neat is that it's simple, but yet it does very complex things, right? So really each recloser only has to talk to its adjacent reclose, the neighbor, the, the reclosers that are adjacent to it. And they share with each other whether or not they saw the fault or not. And each recloser is to make a good decision about whether it needs to trip fast or does it need to slow down and wait for somebody else to clear the fault, for somebody else to interrupt the line? And so it's really kind of this, you know, elegant complexity, if you will, where um, where it's it's fairly easy for us to deploy. Um, it works well, but yet it does this amazing thing of we trip the correct device. Because again, you know, step number one in any kind of power system protection is you got to interrupt the fault, right? I mean, that's that's number one. We got to stop the fault current from flowing. But to that point, in today's world, it's not acceptable to just stop the current flowing from somewhere. We want that selectivity. We want the right device to be the one to trip so the least number of customers are are impacted. And so um, that's what this high density coordination allows us to do by kind of moving to that next step, leveraging modern modern communication networks, modern protocols, um, modern computing power in our 
distributed equipment that's out there on the line and it allows us to do something really powerful. Now, the reality of the world is that we don't have a communication infrastructure all over our system that can support this, right? This is not something you do wirelessly, at least not with today's wireless technology. This is something that it needs the speed and availability of fiber optic communications, which are expensive to deploy. Um, so we also have kind of some non-communicating solutions where it's all about the sequencing of the reclosers, where we trip them open, we close them back one at a time. You know, we're, we're changing the, the trip parameters so that even though they may not have coordinated on the first trip, as they sequence themselves back in, they coordinate properly. And so we did subject all 3,000 customers potentially to a momentary outage. But at the end of the day, we've locked out the correct device. So from a sustained ad standpoint, we've limited that to a smaller number of customers as possible. And that does two things. One, it certainly helps the reliability for those customers that didn't experience a sustained outage. But also when we have miscoordination on the distribution feeder and you have multiple devices lock out, the troubleshooting for our troublemen becomes much more of a nightmare, right? Because they don't know which end is up. They don't know which way to look. And so that's why we talk about that lockout coordination, making sure we lock out the device closest to the fault. That's something we really hold in high regard as being very important because um, it just can really turn into a circus in a hurry whenever you start presenting confusing information to our operation center to the troublement out in the field. So um, that, that non-communicating high density coordination has proven to be very, very valuable in the parts of the state where we've not yet been able to deploy the fiber optic communications required for the other. For the other method. When our, our folks are teaching me about what you guys are doing with the, the non-communication, uh, essentially, uh, restoration system, I, I was so impressed, right? Yeah, you're, you're right. Maybe a bunch of people see a momentary blip, but the way the, uh, the, the reclosers, uh, can figure out how to how to put the system back together, get the most lights back on it. That, that is some really cool technology. I think it's probably easy if you got communication to figure something out. It's when you don't have communications that the way you you grouped recloser controls together to to you know maybe all of them in group A trip off, but they can figure out how to put themselves to together. Is it, that, that's some really cool technology you guys are doing out there in Alabama. Um, so faults faults are going to uh, occur on a, on a on a power system. Maybe you can describe just a little bit about that that part. But the the metrics that you guys are seeing from your your high density um, uh, recloser coordination stuff in terms of savings or reliability. Do you guys have any metrics on on how the system is actually working once it's been deployed? Right. Yeah. So um, we've been fully deployed with our Flizzer system for for a couple of years now. So we've got some pretty good data from how that works. And although, you know, the, the, the Flizzer system itself gets a lot of the credit for, for what it does, and as, as is due, it should. That's a very complex system that works very well. But without the, the equipment out on the line to actually operate, Flizzer is just an academic exercise, right? I mean, yeah, it can figure out where the fault and section is and come up with a plan for how to switch it. But if you don't have these assets on the line, it can't do anything with them automatically. So um, that, that's where you know, this automation strategy and having partners like Switzer that we work with that, that help us come up with these great scenarios that we can get the right device locked out and then let Fizzer take over has really, really given us some great results. In 2021, we had over 500 successful restorations from our, our Flizzer system. And each one averaged about 500 customers um, that were safe from seeing a sustained outage. So, you know, if you do the math on that, that's 250,000 times that one of our customers did not have a sustained outage. Um, and that's big for us statistically. But again, as I said earlier, you know, the big thing is, is that's huge for our customers, you know, whether it be, you know, an industrial customer that still can maintain operation and keep their people working and making money, a commercial operation that can continue selling stuff and, you know, keeping the economy moving. And even from a residential perspective, I got little kids at home when my power goes out and Mickey Mouse sitting on the TV, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> um, you know, so from everybody involved, that's huge. And when I think of 250,000 instances of somebody not being put out by a power outage, you know, that's big to me. And that makes me proud of the things that we're accomplishing around here. Yeah, that's, a, that's amazing. Those statistics are, are, are really impressive. Okay, so you guys have come up with, uh, say, 300 customers per recloser. You've got a great Flizzer system. You can do with communication or not communication to, to put the system back together when, when, when there is a problem on it. From a practical standpoint, though, going from your engineering design, how do you actually deploy all of this equipment 
out on on the pole. You know, I've always thought from a logistics standpoint, there, there's a lot of work. You got to, you know, take outages or you know, put hang stuff on a pole, put a pole in the in the ground and stuff like that. How do you, how do you guys go about managing, you know, such a, a, a an, an aggressive uh, deployment plan across such a large operating territory? Well, you know, that's one of the things engineers are are frequently accused of, right? Is we come up with great plans on paper, but the practical aspects of them are sometimes leaving (laughs) a little bit to be desired. So that's something that we really live. And that's something at the the lab that that we're very passionate about is, you know, taking these big ideas that look great on paper and figuring out when you're in the ditches, you know, how do you actually make this happen? And the reality of, you know, uh, and this we have we have outstanding field forces that are very sharp and very smart, but some of them are fairly new to what they're doing. You know, we have turnover, we have all those kind of things that we have to have a system that is practical to be deployed, right? Because we can come up, we can cook up the greatest idea in the lab that is just this really great whiz bang thing that's perfect. But if I can't boil it down to where the the engineers and and technicians out in the field that have to commission it can repeatedly do it successfully over and over again it's kind of all for nothing, right? It's just a, it's just a fun exercise that we do just a fun science experiment. So um, being able to take something that is complex at the high level and boil it down to, to simplicity is so valuable for us. And um, you know, that's one of the things that we really appreciate about the SEL product line is the fact that, you know, through tools like quick set and design template, and, you know, even some of the stuff that engineering services was able to work out with the communications for our communicating HDC, where, um, it's not a heavy lift for our field to deploy it. It's just so valuable. Um, and it's not just about them being successful at deploying it. They can also be confident in it because I can have a guy do the right thing, but if he gets in his truck and he still leaves kind of questioning whether or not he did the right thing, that's still not good. I need him to be confident that he did the right thing when he leaves. So, um, you know, we really appreciate that something that's simple, simple kind of at the core that we can then build up into a greater thing that's very complex, but that the user interface is also simple and easy to be deployed. So that that's just, that's very, very valuable for us to be able to do that. I think you nailed it on the head, right? Uh, engineers, we, we can come up with some great ideas, but if they can't scale, then then you got a real big challenge. And it sounds like you guys have overcome the the scale the scale problem or the scale challenge to be able to deploy lots of lots of systems out there. All right, this right, I, we haven't. Go ahead. I was going to say that's that's all, where like this particular project with high density coordination was such a success. Um, you know, as we worked with Switzer and we matched, you know, engineering services along with our application engineers and what we we really wanted, and then being able to deliver us not they they didn't help us install a high density coordination scheme. They gave us a a system that we could replicate all over our distribution system, which is so much more valuable to us in the way we're doing things in distribution than just, you know, one neat pet project that we did. <laughs> and then that's all we've got. So it was a huge success. I felt like the, the way that whole relationship went between Alabama power and Switzer and the, the different parties all involved. Oh, that's, that, that's great. Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot and, and ask you, what do you think distribution systems are going to look like 10 years, maybe even 25 years out there? You know, we go look at the, the rap, I'll call it a really rapid change over the last five, six, seven years that that's happened. And it doesn't seem to be slowing down. So where do you, where do you think we're headed in the distribution systems and networks? Well, I mean, I, I think it's such an exciting time to be in this field because things are changing so much, at least for somebody that likes solving problems. It's a very exciting time to be in this field. Um, you know, the the proliferation of inverter-based generation, I really think, is going to change our whole protection paradigm. You know, we're seeing, you know, a weaker system from an impedance standpoint, which means lower fault currents, means deeper voltage sags. Um, you know, a lot of the concerns out there about a lot of this and, you know, this inverter-based generation and how do we distinguish faults from load. And I'm convinced that our paradigm is going to change from being current to something else, be it voltage, be it impedance based, there's there's going to have to be something that changes because I don't think current is going to always continue to be a reliable indicator of trouble on the line like it has been for the last 140 years for us. Um, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, as protection people, we get kind of upset about that to some degree, right? Because it's kind of upset in our apple cart, right? I mean, we this is what we've been doing our whole careers. 
reality, I think if, if we had grown up in a system that didn't have fault current and somebody told us, I'm going to put a generator out there that's going to deliver you 20,000 amps of fault current, we would probably have a fit, right? And say, <laughs> you can't do that, right? Yeah. But it's what we're used to. And I think as, as we, as I think we've seen as our industry, we always do. We're going to rise to the challenge. We're going to find the innovative solutions to protect the system, to do it reliably, to do it selectively so that we can maintain reliability. You know, we're going to do it, but it's going to take a lot of growth, a lot of development. Um, and I think having great partners between the the utilities that have the distribution systems to to try this equipment out, you know, partnering with the manufacturers that have the innovation and being able to make the products that can do it. I think that's very, very valuable and something that we're going to have to have for, for a, a long time. Um, I, I think I'm not convinced that we have the equipment and the technology today that we need to meet that challenge. I think we will have it one day, but I do think that these things that we're doing, like the communication-based high density coordination, um, some of the PMU stuff that were, we had touched on that, but Alabama Power and Southern companies also doing a lot of research in the area of um, PMUs on distribution. I think these things are kind of predecessors to what we're going to have to have in the future to be able to protect this system, um, in particular to do it selectively, right? I mean, we could put under voltage on everything and it would de-energize a faulted line, but we're where there's no selectivity there, right? We're going to knock everybody's power out. So trying to find those solutions. And I really think those two areas in particular that we're experimenting with now and working with and deploying now in their current form are going to grow and get even smarter, even faster, even more reliable and can be kind of the basis of what we build that future protection system on. I, th- I think you're spot on. I'd agree with you hundred percent. There's a lot of opportunities for, for us to come up with new innovative ways to integrate different, you know, IBRs and, and, and what have you into the power system where fault current doesn't look like it used to when you had a big rotating mass, you know, somewhere generating megawatts of, of power. Um, it's, it's exciting time. So John, thank you very much for spending the, well, my morning, probably your, your afternoon or lunchtime. <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate the conversation and uh, you know what, I'm going to have you back on at, at some point, talk about, you know, what, what, what the future of distribution you know, looks like and, and where you guys are at. Cause again, I, I, you know, I find that Alabama power to be really progressive when it comes to, to innovating distribution power systems. So thank you again for, for joining me. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for stopping by Schweitzer drive. Join us again as we learn about explore and celebrate electric power. For more information about the show, please visit selinc.com slash Schweitzer Drive.